Thank you. Hello. Thank you for having me all the way from Australia. I'm very proud to be uh, here giving a Pacific representation because uh, tucked away in that part of the world, we often aren't able to get ourselves onto the European and uh, Northern Hemisphere agenda in general, and so it's a great thrill uh, to be here. I guess my role here today is to give you some sense of what sports diplomacy means in a practical sense. As you have heard, even when it's spelled out, it's still quite an ethereal concept and it can be quite hard to capture in your own mind what it looks like, let alone how you sell that to your other stakeholders, your superiors, your funders, other people who you want to take on the sports diplomacy journey with you. What I wanted to say, first of all, is that everybody in this room is already engaged in sports diplomacy. You just may not have given it that label. You may call it partnership building, you may call it stakeholder engagement, you may call it outreach. There's a whole heap of other labels uh, that combine to give you sports diplomacy, particularly at the grassroots level. So what I hope to do over the next few minutes is give you a sense of how my very accidental journey in sports diplomacy played out, and perhaps you can see a mirror for what that might mean in your world. So I want to start at the end. This is a moment from just one week ago that is I think, the perfect storm of sports diplomacy. Let me explain what's going on in this photo. So that banner that you see there uh, is one of a series of banners that were created from my photography work in grassroots sports in the Pacific. And the top one there is a young girl from Kiribati. The bottom one is a woman from Samoa with a flag supporting a Samoan team. As you can see, great image, captures the sense of being a fan, captures the sense of Pacific sport. So I took that image and it made it into the final exhibition of these banners. Some 18 months, two years after that picture was taken, uh, as part of its sports diplomacy endeavours, the Australian High Commission in Samoa held a sports inclusion event where the para-athlete Dylan Alcott came to be a guest speaker. Those banners were part of the welcome into the room. That woman walked into the room, saw for the very first time the picture of herself, and she is now the chef de mission of the Samoan Olympic Committee who now operates on the world stage. And while I wasn't in the room when that happened, that's the message that came the next day. You're a legend, my friend. Thank you for all that you do to promote our people in sport and empowering women and girls. A moment of very real, uh, grassroots, but also high-level sports diplomacy. So let me tell you a little about myself. Who recognises the guy on the far end there? Who is it? Do you know who the 23 is? Yes, it's Beckham, David Beckham. So I have uh, worked in professional sport for longer than I care to remember. But I always had a fascination with what is going on at the grassroots level, what motivates somebody to have their child involved in sport, what is the joy that brings somebody to a training session on a Tuesday night, and what are the similarities or differences between that and the elite sports experience, the colour, the glitz, the buying the shirt, the paying the season ticket. And part of that fascination manifested some eight or nine years ago now, where when I was working for the public broadcaster in Australia, we came up with a concept to marry up the professional football fantasy with the grassroots experience. So we asked young, junior, very amateur, the final winners were F grade and G grade, I think. We asked them from all across the region to submit via video, tweet, email, however they wanted to, a compelling argument as to why we should put them on the national broadcaster and cover their game, their grassroots game, and treat it like it was a football international. And here's what it sounded like. The New Lambton Football Club Eagles versus the Katara South Football Club Tigers. Under 12, Division F. 
Novocastrian Park. Yes, good morning and welcome to Novocastrian Park, New Lambton. Where, as you can hear, a huge crowd is in for this highly anticipated round ball football match. Mate, we've commentated in some places and uh, this is a lot better than Melbourne Knights at some degrees, <laughs> I can tell you that. So, it gives you a sense we called the game just like it was an international. It got a huge following, the club's got a huge boost, they got new sponsors. The question is, it never occurred to me at the time that that could be characterised as diplomacy. That was more or less a marketing or a community outreach exercise, but it... Oh, and due to the way that is up there, you can't see it at all because it's white on white. But uh, it raised the profile of the public broadcaster. It raised the profile of junior sport. It celebrated the values of sport. It recognised volunteers, built a sense of community. In the second year, it was a girls' match. Uh, just coincidentally, in the first year, the two winners were boys. In the second year, it was a girls' match. But what it did was it imagined a pathway from participation to professionalism. It invited that fantasy, and it really captured people's imagination. So, uh, there we go. We're in business now. So then, uh, I went professionally to the grassroots level and joined the Pacific Sports Partnerships. Uh, I was originally invited to go to Papua New Guinea and work with their sports broadcast teams up there, and it led to uh, me working on the PSP, which is uh, a partnership between the Australian government and national and international sports bodies to deliver to target sport for development activities. And it aims to increase regular participation of Pacific Islanders in quality sports activities, improve health-related behaviours which impact on non-communicable diseases, risk factors, and increase the inclusion of people with a disability in Pacific communities, all of those being very real challenges. And this is what it looked like. Those are all the sports that were involved down the left-hand column, and across the top you can see the countries involved, Cook Islands, Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga and Vanuatu. And so I worked covering stories across all of those countries and sports. So it, I came to live a double life between my home uh, professional sports experience and living a life in the Pacific in grassroots sport. So what did that look like? When we were doing health coverage, it was, for example, about uh, university students tackling suicide, about uh, addressing mental health challenges with music therapy. Uh, here it is in a gender equity sense. Pacific Sports shoots development goals on International Women's Day. Uh, this is a remarkable young woman who referees adult men's rugby matches in Fiji. That is a challenging errand. Uh, this is what it looks like in an inclusion sense. And one of the things about a small place like the Pacific is the lines between the elite and the grassroots are very blurry. Uh, there is a very short distance. You can be competing for the Commonwealth Games one day and be on some remote island teaching a clinic the next. So we had huge, uh, unprecedented levels of connection. 11 million people reached through social media. And at this point, the lines between journalism and sports diplomacy or uh, covering what was going on out there and uh, creating relationships was blurring. It was journalism, but it was also about storytelling. It was fundamental communication. It was international and interpersonal. It was creating connections, explaining challenges and progress, improving understanding, building relationships, and it was starting to look a lot like diplomacy. Here you can see a story about Kiribati, which in many ways is about climate change, but it's a story told through the spectrum of sport. Here is a story about keeping kids safe after dark in Papua New Guinea, uh, a sports diplomacy slash sport for development interface. And then the Australian government created a formal sports diplomacy strategy, the SD2030, to strengthen Australian sport and opportunities for athletes globally and unlock their full potential to support our national interests. So I had an idea for how we could leverage that. And we took a grassroots idea called Commentary for Good and took it global. 
It was the world's first academically researched sports commentary for development program designed in Australia and developed in the Pacific and it allows local language coverage of any level of sport from the under 12s to the World Cup as you will see. So it was multicultural, multilingual, capacity scalable, empowering anyone to deliver compelling highly professional live sports coverage via traditional and new media wherever the audience is, infused with key messages of social change. So the first steps were a group of Indigenous Australian men and women from the Tiwi Islands, Aboriginal community. They learned the system. They broadcast their local Australian Football League to the Bathurst and Melville Islands, virtually a plug and play, stuck a transponder in the ground and sent it out, and then were ultimately broadcast right across Australia. Then we had the international challenge of producing Olympic-style coverage of the 2015 Pacific Games in Papua New Guinea. 40 men and women with vastly different capacities from all over Papua New Guinea were recruited and they delivered two weeks of professional commentary broadcast right across the Pacific. To this day, 40 years the NBC has been running, it is the most positive feedback in the history of the national broadcaster. Then we got another global test. Five women were chosen from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs Women in Sport and News and Sport Initiative. They learned the commentary for good system and they used it to cover the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. Of the five women that were involved, uh, three now have their own TV shows, two are working as regular commentators and everybody who has been involved in the program is getting professional commentary work in countries where there had never before been female commentators of any description. So the m and &E on this was showing greater respect from colleagues, self-belief and, belief and capacity growth from covering a global event. Really interesting chicken and egg. They were being told, we can't trust you going to these big events because the men have always done it and they've got the runs on the board. And so we must continue to trust the men. Uh, we couldn't risk it by giving it to you. But by us giving them the opportunity to do it, all of a sudden that excuse was gone. And quite frankly, they outperformed the men immeasurably and so have had many more opportunities as a result. Greater focus on women's sport, cultural empowerment. And then in 2018, we had a huge opportunity. We made history by covering the OFC Nations Cup semi-finals in the Bishlama and Itokai Fijian languages, as well as Pacific English, and we cut a deal to broadcast the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup back to the Pacific. So these were women who had never called a professional football game in their life, uh, getting involved in this program, excelling, proving themselves, and ultimately going on to the World Cup. Grassroots had become elite and it went crazy around the world. We got coverage from the BBC, we got coverage from NPR, Radio New Zealand, all over the world. People were just taken by this idea. Here's just a little, there's a few copyright issues with us giving you World Cup coverage, but here's just a little cheeky taste of what some of it sounded like. Uh, Ali, where we captain the team, Ali this time, one long la pastor beside the castle, Kati. At this single time, Palang this time, trying to find one time. Ah, record. One point for New Zealand, no pressure. And inside, one, one, no pressure from New Zealand to play equalise and score the second half. Now, what does that mean from a diplomatic sense? Take a look, a look at this. This is Fatma Samura, who is the first female Secretary General of FIFA, and a Senegalese former diplomat tweeting her support for it. Uh, that top comment is from it going viral through social media in the Pacific, a huge amount of cultural pride out there, and uh, that is the Australian Foreign Affairs Minister uh, offering her support as well. You've already heard, you've already seen about the Sustainable Development Goals. Commentary for Good is designed to specifically tackle the Sustainable Development Goals. Education, gender equality, decent work, industry and innovation, reduced inequalities, responsible production, peace and justice. But also, it's a way to speak so communities listen. It empowers communities by upskilling for the digital age. 
It's a way to give focus to social change campaigns and it's a new way to connect the world through sport. Oops. So then, earlier this year, the opportunity came for me to try and make the strategy work. Uh, under the guidance of Caitlin Byrne at the Griffith Asia Institute and in conjunction with Stuart Murray, who is well known to many of you from uh, Bond University in Australia, uh, I got the job of trying to make the strategy work. These are the four pillars of the Australian Sports Diplomacy Strategy, to empower Australian sport to represent Australia globally, to build linkages with our neighbours, to maximise trade, tourism and investment opportunities and to strengthen communities in the Indo-Pacific region. So that was quite the challenge to bring all of those elements together. That means people who are making wearable tech, like we saw in the presentation earlier this morning, uh, innovations at that level, people designing stadiums, kids involved in drink water, not orange juice campaigns, all of them, how do they come under one umbrella of sports diplomacy? Then it flipped the other way. I was involved in a groundbreaking initiative where the Australian government sent the Australian national under 16 football team on a three country tour of the Pacific to raise the profile of women's sport in that region. Women's sport suffers terribly in that part of the world. It was a chance to put all the theory into practice, a grassroots diplomatic mission. Again, huge coverage and uh, huge groundbreaking moments. The first ever live broadcast of a women's sports event in Tonga. The first time women had ever been allowed to play on the national stadium in Honiara in the Solomon Islands. The first time a women's international had ever been played in one of these countries. A significant amount uh, at one of the countries uh, the captain, who was quite soundly beaten by Australia, uh, the Nevan captain gave a quite emotional plea saying we can't be expected to compete if we don't have support for women's sport and a good chunk of money arrived a couple of weeks after to support them. So, this will just give you a little taste of what that experience was like. Here's the Tonga video. <laughs> Pacific Step Up Tour. So we're pressed for time, but I thought I might tell you a couple of things that I have learned that you may be able to apply in your own personal context. Sports diplomacy is not a formula and it's not a game. In developing environments, the separation between grassroots and elite is often blurry. That is both uh, a strength, a weakness, an opportunity and a threat for you all, I think. Sports diplomacy is undervalued by many, misunderstood by most, and widely treated with suspicion, particularly by the old guard who think that sports diplomacy is done with people in blue suits in darkened rooms for agendas that you don't need to know about. Uh, they find it particularly threatening, and so uh, hence why ISCA and others are trying to do a bottom-up education campaign. That is our only hope. The real balancing act is between influence. Diplomacy is about influence, is about asserting a certain set of interests versus the respect for the environment and the people that you're working with. Uh, it is not for me to stand here and suggest where that balance lies for you, but I think it's critical that you have that conversation. Many diplomatic engagements are fundamentally inequitable. They are power imbalances and culture and local agency can suffer as a result. There can be no common language. But sports diplomacy is a fairer engagement. It provides a unique post-colonial, 
ostensibly egalitarian, mutually respectful mechanism for sharing values. That'd look great on a bumper sticker, wouldn't it? But um, <laughs> nevertheless, it's as efficient and comprehensive as I can get it into one sentence. It's a common language, but spoken with a local cultural dialect. The good news is that you can personally influence international relations through grassroots sport. The bad news is you can personally influence international relations through grassroots sport. Approach sports diplomacy as a diplomatic mission, not as a sports event. It's a simple idea but the implications are huge in that. Modern sports diplomacy is a powerful new tool for building important and resilient relationships, tackling the SDGs and improving lives. And like the grassroots sports match, we're often the players and the referees in this game. It's dangerous to underestimate its power to do good and its power to do damage. And I issue this challenge to everyone here looking to use it. At every stage, ask yourself, what do we consider a win? What is the price of a failure in this space? And why precisely do we even want to play this game? I think there are powerful and compelling answers to all of those, but I think nobody ought to embark on this journey until they have asked themselves. So make sure that you have a game plan. It's just like any other game plan. I'll leave that up there just for a second because a couple of you want to take photos, although this will be available afterwards. Critical for those reasons that we said before, that people misunderstand it and often mistrust it, is that you need to have all stakeholders united, all stakeholders having a voice and having a unified vision going forward for your sports diplomacy mission. If you have a muddy message, you will go nowhere. And the end result, the final dividend, the possibilities at both the fundamental grassroots level and the highest international relations level can be a lot more than a photo and a smile. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today.